Unit 16, part 3. Okay, so T is false, right? So this does necessitate S being false, right? How did I have that? Look at the conditions here. Just because I'm looking for a counterexample, every premise has to be true, and the biconditional had to be true, right? Um, and I've determined that T had to be false, so T has to be false, right? So the only way for the biconditional to be true if T false is if S is also false, right? So I can lock that in, right? S is false. Now, we've just found out that S is false, so wherever S appears in the premises or conclusion, it's always false. S is false over here. Let's take a look at premise two and see what I can determine about it. I've got, right, we started with the assignment of, uh, with, we assign, we started, right, if we're gonna find a counterexample, all the premises have to be true. The counterexample is what, uh, an assignment of the truth values that makes the premises true and the conclusion false, right? So the biconditional has to be true. We have to meet that requirement, right? Otherwise, right, if we somehow contradict that requirement, we haven't got a counterexample. Right? If we cannot meet that, so think of it this way. If we cannot meet that requirement, think about what happened with the modus ponens attempt. If we can't meet that requirement, it probably means we can't find a counterexample, which means, as long as we haven't made a mistake, that the argument form is valid. We can meet the requirement of making all the premises true in our assignment. That would be a counterexample, showing it's invalid. Right, so this is true. Okay, so the biconditional has to be true. P is true. So what else has to be true? Well, the um, other side of the biconditional, which is the negation. Right? That has to be true. The negation has to be true because that's the major operator of that subformula. And notice that. Um, the only other variable is R here, but R here, the only other variable is R here, but I can't actually determine, or I don't actually need to determine anything about R, right? T is false. Um, T's falsity suffices for the falsity of the conjunction, right? right. So if R is true, the, the, condition, the conjunction is false. If R is false, the condition, the conjunction is false, right? P's falsity suffices for that being false, and that's what that has to be for that to be true, right? So, it, 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 what you should be, the way you should be thinking this is, um, I've already sort, I've already satisfied keeping P two true. Remember, you're trying to keep all the premises true, um, or you're trying to make all the premises true and the conclusion false. This assignment that we've got so far where we've got um, T and P, is all used there, that suffices for keeping that true, right? So, so far so good in attempting to find my counterexample. Um, I put S there, okay, so if I can, so S had to be, had to be fault, uh, false, yes, that makes that biconditional true, so we've sort of succeeded in making that true, so it all comes down to now premise one. Can I satisfy making this conjunction true? Sorry, making this conditional true, right, on the assignment of truth values to the potential variables which has been necessitated, right? P, we said, had to be true. S, we said, had to be false, okay? Now, the whole thing has to be true. Can we do it, right? Can we make this conditional true? Well, so long as we don't have T hook false, okay, we're good if we can avoid that because that's the only way a conditional is false. Well, look, the truth of P suffices for the truth of the antecedent, right? The antecedent is the, this disjunction, right? That's true. So we've got true hook something. So in order to keep this true, as we need to to have a counterexample, this must be true. That is, the disjunction must be true. Homing in on an assignment for R, right? Um, because if it was T hook false, 
we have, would have failed to keep the first premise true, or we would have failed to make the first premise true, and thus fail to arrive at a counterexample, right? Um, but we can make, okay, so we, we have to avoid t-hook faults, we have to make this, um, the, con the overall consequent true, that means the disjunction has to be true, right? But we can make the disjunction true because we're free. So here we didn't have to assign anything to R. We're free to assign R whatever we want. We just have to make R true. The truth of R suffices for the truth of the disjunction. So this, this conditional turns out to be T hook T, keeps that true. So R is true, right? Voila, that's it. We, you know, what we say is, right, Q notice is undetermined, so Q can be true or false. So that assignment of truth values is a counterexample, and also if Q equals F, that assignment of truth values also makes all the premises true and equals or false. What have we done? Okay, it's important to this is sort of mechanical, but know what you're doing when you're doing it, right? Um, we have um, found. Right? So it's equivalent to if we did a huge truth table with what? 2, 4, 8, 16, with 32 rows. Right? It's as if we did a truth table with 32 rows and we found um, the row, it would look like this, um, where all the premises true came out true and the conclusion false. The true, 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 false. Right? The counterexample in the, in the um, truth table. It's as if we found that. Right? We've um, found an assignment of truth values to the intent of variables which make the premises true and the conclusion false. What have we proved? We've proved that this argument form has counterexamples. It has substitution instances for the premises and conclusion which make the premises true and the conclusion false. Thus, the argument is not valid.